Hi, good afternoon. I'll present a lecture by Dr. Tranquilino Carlos Hernandez, a specialist in orthopedics and traumatology with a subspecialty in spine surgery. I'll have been working in traumatology and spine orthopedics for approximately three years. I'm a graduate of Centro Médico Nacional de Occidente of the city of Guadalajara, Jalisco. Today, we are going to talk about a universal topic for all orthopedics and traumatology surgeons, and even more so for spine surgeons, anterior and posterior surgic approaches to the cervical spine. The objectives of today's presentations are to describe in a simple way how we can carry out an anterior and posterior approach to the cervical spine including the descript description of spine anatomy, knowing the indications and contraindications of surgical approaches, and of course, a good surgeon must know how to handle comp complications that can happen when undergoing any time of surgery. For as long as I've been in this space, the anterior and posterior approach to the cervical spine has been a useful method for solving multiple spine pathologies. It has been used for a long time and continues to be used today. The anterior cervical approach has been described in different parts of the world. Going back to 1950, Dr. Smith reviewed its many advantages. It's a procedure that with a prepaid training, it's not so complicated to carry out. It should be a not traumatic procedure. The incision can be transverse or parallel to the sternocleidomastoid muscle with no large incision and blunt dissection to the anterior aspect of the spine, leaving no scars or major limitations. The main indication for anterior cervical approach is the compression of the spinal canal due to this carnation or some cervical pathology either by removing the disc or performing a corpectomy when two or more discs are to be removed. An arthrodosis is also indicated for fractures through a combined posterior approach. Other indications include tumors, infections such as disc infections. Some relatives and absolute contraindications for this approach would be changes in the skin due to re radiations which correlates with high rates of necrosis. Patients with morbid obesity are very difficult due to the great amount of fat in the neck. Lastly, previous surgery or pathology associated with injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve or vocal cord paralysis. The anterior cervical approach Technique includes having the patients in a supine position with the neck extended, with the shoulders extended and the head rotated 10 to 15 grades to the left or right, depending on the surgeon's preference. Some surgeons prefer the left side due to the locations of the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right side. You identify the site of the approach through palpation of the trachea, palpation of the thyroid and cricot cartilage, and with direct observation under fluoroscopy. In this image, we see a patient with a neck in extension. In patients with unstable spine due to fracture, we must be very careful with this position due to the risk of causing neurologic injuries and emphasize that the roll is placed behind the neck to allow extension and rotation. An inverted Trendelenburg position between 20 and 30 degrees can help reduce bleeding by decreasing vein of return. Once we mark our incision, we must note the anatomical reference. We recommend this approach from C2 to T1. There are important anatomical references such as the hyoid at the level 
C3, the thyroid between C4 and C5, the cricoid at C6, the carotid tubercles and the longitudinal line of the neck at the sternocleidomastoid muscle. From there towards the midline we have the main anatomical reference, the blood vessels and the carotid artery and the jugular veins. There we see in the model the skin incision when it's a single level incision, that is to say from C4 to C5, C5 to C6. Transverse incision can be made if they are multi-level. It is advisable to make transverse incisions to the sternocleidomastoid. The incision is made in skin and subcutaneous cellular tissue, carefully cauterizing the subcutaneous vessels to avoid hematomas. The first structure we find and sometimes we dissect or cauterize is the platysma. Then we make a blunt incision either with gauze or digitally to retract the trachea and the esophagus medially at the basals laterally. We immediately find the pretracheal fascia which we incise through blunt dissection and we find ourselves at the anterior longitudinal ligament, the vertebral disc and the vertebral bodies. We are able to distinguish the intervertebral disc because they are like small anterior protrusions that give us the margins to know what is the intervertebral space. Here in this sheet we see the anatomical reference to consider such as the angle of the jaw, the infraoid and supraoid muscles and the platysma, the sternocleidomastoids and the basals that we must respect. Here we see in this plane how we are separated through travel medial tract and the esophagus laterally, the basals. Initially, we find the anterior face of the cervical spine with the long muscle of the neck that has been mentioned in previous image. We also see intervertebral disc, the vertebral bodies, and occasionally in the degenerative spine, we find osteophytes and disc protrusions. In this sheet, we see how with a blunt dissection, the anatomical reference to the sternocleidomastoid muscles is seen. We see the thyroid vein that we have to take care of and the pretracheal fascia. There we can also see the sternocleidal muscles that we occasionally must visualize to reinsert it. Once we remove this, we find the pretracheal fascia and when placing out the automatic separator, we see the vertebral bodies, which can be worked on in a longitudinal, longitudinal incision. Occasionally, although when the surgeon has a lot of experience, there are usually no complications, since it's a completely longitudinal and blunt dissection, but there can occasionally be complications due to the manipulation of the esophagus. The patients may present with dysphagia or due to the recurrent laryngeal nerve present with dysphonia and may also present with Horner syndrome. Hematomas can happen, that's why it's important to leave drains or to perform complete hemostasis. With bipolar cautery or with conventional cautery, the arterial risk, especially when we manipulate the longus coli that can misplace us in the anatomy, where the vertebral artery passes, which carries the risk of injuring it. In disectomies and corpectomies, there may be a risk of infection or osteomyelitis from detachment of the material and there may be anatomical arterial nervous and venous variants that can lead some complications if we don't consider them. Here in this image we see an example of the anterior cervical approach for a young patient with a disc pathology. In this case we placed disc prosthesis so that the patient could immediately, immediately recover his mobility and avoid 
upper segment syndrome, a traditional arthritis that is performed in cervical spine, either with autologous graft or with some other implant. Another example that we have here on in this slide is that the anterior cervical approach can be combined with the posterior approach depending on the pathology. In this case, we had a patient who suffered a bifacet dislocation, fortunately without neurological complications. It was approached initially from the back. We make the reductions of the facet fixations with laminar facet screw with the Mager technique and an implant with a plate to promote the anterior arthrosis and immobilize that segment. Another example of the anterior cervical approach is in the degenerative spine. In this case, there is an elderly patient with a chronic smoker who had a narrow cervical canal. And through this approach, we worked on three levels, performing discompression and arthrosis. We are going to talk about the posterior cervical approach. In my many years experience since I was a resident, the posterior cervical approach is an approach that is still practiced because it is fast, safe, direct approach, and once you know the technique, there are not so many complications involved. Personally, the primar primary indications is for uni or bifacet dislocations for posterior functions, for implant placement. I try not to use it for these extractions due to the high risk of neurologic neurological sequelae that can be caused, caused by retreating the dural sac or spinal cord. The contraindications are definitely for a central compression because the anterior approach gives us more visibility and instability patients with previous surgeries where there is a lot of fibrosis due to laminectomies for a minotomy and who have a neurological deficit. In regards to technique, the patient is placed in a prone position with a slight flexion of the head. We identify the size of the incision through the vertebral protrusion of the spinous process of C7 with fluoroscopic control in, pa in patients with spinal cord trauma or fracture dislocations, complex dislocations. In this image, we see from the process of C2 to the prominent process of C7. An incision is made in the midline of the skin. The ligaments are incised up to the spinous process, posteriorly and gently, because in the lumbar spine, more force can be used but in the cervical spine, one has to be very gentle. The incision is very close to the posterior lamina, to the lateral meses, for catering no high voltage because it causes burns that may cause neuro neurological damage. The lamina is exposed at the facets up to the transverse process and the procedure can can be carried out. It is very important to know how to identify the anatomical structures when there are bifacet dislocations. The articular portions of the facets can be perceived. You can see in the diagram of the musculature how it dissects laterally completely up to the articular process. The muscles of the posterior part of the neck are incised. Complications, as may occur in any surgery, occasionally there may be arterial injuries, especially with surgeons who are not very experienced and who are not familiar with the approach. In senile patients or in patients with osteopenia, there is Excessive decortication due to osteopenia of the transfer process of the lateral muscles of the bone and cortical bone. In general, in very high approach, we can injure the occipital nerve at the level of C2 or C3 
in patients with immunosuppression or diabetes, hematoma, or gut infections. It's not always recommend to leave a drain to Renovac due to the great musculature. Generally for 24 to 48 hours depending on how much the drain puts out. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Tranquilino Carlos Hernandez, an orthopedic traumatologist and spinal surgeon from the city of Toretta. We have residents in training and I hope that my experience will be of some use to a college who is listening to this conference. My best regards. Have a good afternoon.